So the second objective is to identify um, common problems and recommended techniques to prevent those problems from happening. So our brains have evolved over time to function on autopilot, that default, no, net, that default mode network. Um, and that's important, as I talked about, in, re in regard to the amount of resources that are necessary to keep your brain and your body functioning, right? So our cells take energy and every time we are taking, making an action, we're, you know, we're having a thought there and we're taking, making an associated action, that movement cycle is utilizing energy. And we only have so much energy within our body and within our cells at any given time. And so if we were to put maximum energy into every single decision and every single action, then it is likely that we wouldn't be able to function very well and we would actually tap out our resources rather quickly. And so, so our brains and our bodies have evolved to have a, you know, a reflexive automatic network of responding. So information comes in, information is processed, a decision is rapidly made, and within, you know, within milliseconds, a response is generated, whether that's a thought, words that come out of your mouth, a physical action, something, right? Something happens in response to that information coming in on autopilot. And the, those behaviors, those responses that are happening on autopilot, those are the ones that have been frequently practiced and they have been potently reinforced, right? So this is just, you know, behavior science 101. When, you know, the, when we do things over and over and they come in contact with reinforcement over and over or they get high level, high magnitude reinforcement, those neural networks go from a single, you know, a, a weak path to a stronger path because they've been, it's been um, repeated over and over and strengthened. So there's more dendrite connections, there's more synapses, there's more neuron, neuron to neuron connections, um, and that pathway is strengthened. And so those high probability behaviors, so when you're kind of in that free operant responding mode, automatic pilot, um, default mode network, those high probability behaviors are the ones that have been practiced, the ones that have been potently reinforced, though that is your autopilot. It is a very useful feature of our brains and our bodies, but it is also something that can backfire because we don't always attend to the relevant details or most important information when making decisions. So while it can be very useful, and it generally is, you know, we're, we're driving along, I don't have to think about where my, you know, I don't have to think about where my turn signal is or where my windshield wipers are or, you know, how to accelerate or decelerate or how to, you know, pass vehicles. I don't really have to think about those things. Those are things that I've done a lot. They've been reinforced. They're strong behavior patterns and we just, I just do them. Um, but if you're always an autopilot and not attending to those, those, important de those important details, it is likely that you will engage in some, or you will, it, that those decisions will result in some level of pain and suffering because you've been disengaged and you haven't engaged in a more intentional thought process, an intentional decision-making system in order to um, take action. In addition to kind of just our, you know, our, our steady, our kind of normal state is to be in just automatic pilot and just going to respond how I respond without thinking. Added on top of this is the, um, the issue when you are in a, in a stress state. So when you're in a stress state, 
and you are more, um, uh, you are, you know, your limbic system is more active and you are hyper vigilant, you're on alert, you're ready to, you know, ready to act at any moment. Um, that's when your fight, flight, and freeze behaviors are most readily accessible. Um, and so, you know, when you have those two things in combination, you have, you're generally on autopilot and now we're in a stress state. And so there's, you know, it's easier to kind of go into that automatic responding immediately to get rid of that, whatever the painful, painful stimuli is that we're dealing with. So that, you know, we're on high alert and something happens and we don't like it and it's aversive. And so it's boom, and that automatic response to avoid that loss, avoid that aversive consequence. Um, but so yes, that is important and it can be very adaptive and it can help us and it can protect us, but it can also cause us to make, make irrational decisions because we're making decisions too quickly um, without consideration of the big picture. So when we have major decisions that we need to make, it's critical that we are focused on how we are going to engage our intentional decision-making system um, as opposed to kind of continuing to function within that um, automatic system. I did a, uh, I, or I uh, participated in a training the other day, it, and it was really, um, it was actually, it was really cool to see the counselor at our school um, provide training and provide some uh, information to the teachers and aides who are, who are participating in our professional development program. Um, it was really cool to hear her way of describing the brain and our automatic responding system and our limbic, you know, that, um, that fight, flight, freeze system. Um, and she, she used a visual representation, which is one that um, is in some published literature. But I really liked it and I thought it was a very good example of um, a way that we can describe things to ourselves and help others understand the way that our brains work. And so she did it with a, a visual of a hand. And so kind of she showed that this, you know, if you imagine that this is your brain and your fingers are your cortex, your intentional thought processes, um, your intentional cognitive system, and underneath, kind of inside your brain, you have the um, that limbic system, the more reflexive system of responding. When we're, um, you know, when we're just normally kind of going through our day, things are calm, steady state, we're open, centered, and engaged, we're ready to go, you know, our, our brains are processing information in a... Um, in a very you know, thoughtful, logical, rational way, right? Um, but when we are in a stress state, our limbic system, this response, this automatic response is more easily accessible and your rational thought process is less easily accessible. And so it's easier to um, kind of respond in a reflexive manner when you're in a stress state and you're hypervigilant and on high alert, as opposed to when you're in a calm state and everything is, you know, your, your brain is completely connected, your processes are connected. I just thought that was a really interesting visualization. She, you know, there was a second step to the, um, to the exercise, which was to actually, you know, on a rubber glove that you wore on your hand was to, would, was to actually draw a picture of, um, your brain or a, like a visual representation of something peaceful and organized and beautiful. And then inside when you're, you know, your lid was flipped and you're making irrational decisions. It was, you know, this is, um, 
you know, where more chaos is happening. Um, and so I thought that was a really good, um, a really good visualization of that, um, of that process and an easy way for somebody who might not have as much um, knowledge or understanding of the brain and how things work um, to um, grasp onto. So there are, there are 12 techniques. There's 12 things that you could do um, in order to prevent judgment errors. And again, similarly to the, the, to the eight step, eight step decision-making process and similarly to the five questions that you should ask to avoid judgment errors, they're not, it's not necessarily going to come as a surprise, but again, knowledge is, knowledge is not the same as action. So it's one thing to know it, it's another thing to do it. Um, so this is us, um, setting the framework, setting the stage for how we're going to talk about these things and the things that we're going to want to practice um, in our day-to-day decision-making. Um, okay, so the 12 techniques. The first technique is to identify and make a plan to address dangerous judgment errors. So just thinking about what you're going to do when decisions need to be made. Um, that is an important step to take and a technique to use. So just being aware that when I make decisions, it is likely that I will make judgment errors if I don't engage my intentional system, okay? And make a plan. Every time I have an important decision to make, first I'm going to, in my, you know, in my case, my first step is to go to my journal and it's just to write about it and get, you know, brain dump all the things that are going on in my head. Because while we, um, you know, well, we're really, our brains are really good about considering um, information. A lot of times we don't put our thoughts into fully formulated sentences. And so those thoughts can be can feel less concrete. And so when we have a decision to make, if we first take the step to brain dump, write down everything related to um, that decision that we need to make and the concerns that we have um, can provide us a, a solid frame for, or a, you know, a jumping off point from which to use for our decision-making process. The second strategy is to just delay decision making in general. And this can be for, um, for both positive things that, things that seem really positive and, that, and things that seem really negative. Um, you know, this is, this is something that I personally struggle with because sometimes I'll just, you know, I'll have an idea and it will, you know, it'll sound really good. It will feel really good. My gut, like everything's saying like, oh yeah, let's go, let's do this. Um, and I'll, you know, sometimes get so wrapped up in the excitement of it. Like, no, this must happen. Um, that I will not resist the urge, will not be able to resist the impulse to do that thing that I, you know, send that email, make that phone call, um, you know, do that thing, whatever, to buy that, buy that thing. Um, and so kind of, but when, when I, when anyone, when me or anyone is responding impulsively, again, it's usually common that you're not fully thinking through the whole big picture. And so if you simply delay decision-making, okay, if I first have a thought and it's like, I, I need to fill in the blank. Um, you know, if you get in the habit of delaying that decision, put it down on your list, put it down on tomorrow, you know, tomorrow I'm going to think about this decision or I'm going to revisit this idea. Um, because again, our impulsive decisions are not always the best decisions. And so we can just get in the habit of delaying that de those decisions 
not just, you know, not responding to our impulses that can help, um, you know, just slow us down a little bit. The third technique is mindfulness meditation. And this was something that we talked about during our first course and in relation to getting into the present moment, coming into the here and now. Um, and, you know, again, this is a really, this is a very important and helpful strategy because it allows us to see things for what they really are. Really listen, listen to what your thoughts are saying. Listen to what your body is telling you. Um, you know, really think about what is going on and see things for what, what it truly is, not just what your brain tells you it is. Um, so getting present, being mindful, meditating on things um, before you're making decisions is really, um, can be really helpful. Um, probabilistic thinking is the is a strategy in which you are um, you're identifying the likelihood of some an outcome happening or something uh, you know something being likely to or not likely to happen. So what is the probability if I were you know if I were to do this, what is the probability that this would be the outcome versus this? Right? Because just because you do something and just because you think that it's going to have a positive outcome doesn't necessarily mean that the outcome is 100% guaranteed, right? We know that we know this from our life experiences. Um, but based on your history and based on you know, previous decisions, you probably have some sort of reference point in, in relation to the probability of this decision or this action having the intended consequence, the intended effect. Um, that is related to the next one, which is to make predictions about the future. So if I do this, right, I predict that X, Y, or Z can happen. Um, and taking, taking time to step back and think through those things, like what, could happen. What is the worst case scenario? What's the best case scenario? What's the, like, what do I hope happens? What do I fear happens? Um, though take, taking the time to do those mental exercises, to think through those things, write about them, um, and consider all of those angles can be very, um, can be very powerful in just, again, slowing and a lot of what these techniques are about is just about slowing down your decision making, making things more intentional, and making sure that you're considering all the variables, not just the things that are most um, readily accessible in your mind. The next strategy is to consider alternative explanations and options. So, you know, when something happens or we, you know, we we see something, we hear something, we think something. Um, sometimes we can automatically um, d derive a, an explanation for why things are the way they are. Or, you know, um, this is the, uh, you know, this is the only option. This feels like the only option. But there's always more than one option. There's not always, there's not only just one thing that can be done to solve a problem. Um, and so again, taking the time to think through, go step, you know, step by step, talk to multiple people, get different perspectives, think about what other things you could do, what other, you know, potentially creative solutions could we implement um, to address the problem that we're, that we're dealing with. What other way, you know, I've gathered this piece of information and I've described it or I've explained it in this way, but what's an alternative explanation? How, how else could that be interpreted or what else could that mean in relation to the solution that I'm trying to develop? The next one is to consider past experiences. So you have it at your disposal, you have memories of his, historical decisions that you've made, ex historical experiences that you've had that provide you with a wealth of information regarding 
um, your future decision making and things that could happen. Um, so tap it, so tapping into that and really thinking about, you know, don't forget the things that have happened. And just because something has happened in the past doesn't mean that it's going to happen in the future, but it, there are things that have happened in the past that have caused you to, um, have, you know, have yellow or red flags. Um, and those are things that you, that shouldn't be taken lightly. They're definitely things that um, you want to make sure are, um, are being thought about and considered um, while you're, while you're making a decision. Um, the next thing is to con uh, consider long-term future and repeating scenarios. So if you do something, right, if you, if you choose to act now, what could that, what could that entail in the future? What are, what, what might you see coming back around and, and, and happening again? If you don't do something, what is the long-term future consequences of that? What are the things that are going to happen over and over? And again, those are, that could be something that you're okay with. You're okay, um, uh, you know, not, um, you know, you're okay with that, with the, um, with the idea that you're going to continuously have problems with your mother-in-law, for instance. Um, and you, you know, and so you decide to continue doing what you're doing as opposed to making a change, even though this is, this is going to happen. Because you've considered it, that might be just okay with you but it's important to think about what are those things that could happen. Um, one of the things that I struggle with the most, and I think a lot of people do struggle with as well, is considering the perspectives of other people. Um, and this technique, this strategy, really relies on our ability, ability to effectively communicate, to actively listen, to um, ask questions that are meaningful, to listen to answers, to integrate other people's opinions and integrate other people's information. Um, and, you know, uh, this, is, this is definitely one that I have struggled with in, um, in my life. Uh, and that usually has been, or commonly has been related to the fact that when I'm making decisions, I, you know, I want to um, I want to make decisions quickly, or there's a big problem that needs, you know, needs an immediate or feels has felt like it has needed an immediate solution. Um, and so rather than um, seeking out additional information, um, I've made decisions without considering other people's perspectives, um, which has caused problems, um, has caused problems in my life um, because it, and, you know, things ended up not going well and again, it could have been prevented had I um, considered the perspective of other people. Um, the next one is using that outside view to get an external perspective. And so this was something that we worked on during, or during the last course and when we were talking about our psychological flexibility skills. And it's that ability to step outside of yourself, right? And be that third party observer, look at the big picture, um, and so it's important to get other people's perspectives, but there's, and, and that should be something that's, um, that's done, um, always, but we have a lot of information. Again, if we can, like, if we can get present, if we can diffuse from the negative, if we can step back and become that observer self and see the big picture and see things from, for what they are, um, you might be able to see additional patterns, um, that you might not otherwise have seen had you stayed, stayed at kind of that molecular level. And the final thing to do is to make a, or um, sorry, not the final thing. So the um, 11th thing to do is to set policies for yourself or future or for your organization, you know, actually step-by-step step how you're going to make decisions. What are the steps that you're going to take? I think that, you know, as, behavior analysts, we have a really, you know, good skill set in regard to breaking down the 
behaviors of others, the things that we are trying to teach others to do. Um, but don't always take that and apply it to ourselves and our coworkers and the organizations which we are running um, to clearly delineate the steps of you know, the task analysis of what it means to make a decision um, and make an effective decision. And so by you know, setting a policy of you know, what, you know, before this happens, when we want to make a change, these are the steps that we need, that we all have agreed to, that we're going to take. Um, and then making a, um, a pre-commitment to that. So committing to yourself, committing to others, um, you know, putting it out there, sharing that goal with other um, people to make sure that you have um, accountability partners and people who are going to be willing to hold you accountable or that you can hold yourself accountable to. Um, to make sure that you're not functioning in a, um, in a more impulsive or um, a rational um, frame, of, frame of mind as you're making decisions. So the exercise for this objective um, will ask you to describe the, the technique that you feel the most confident about um, using effectively, and then the one that you don't feel confident about. Um, because again, we are, you know, none of these things, none of these strategies, none of these techniques are so groundbreaking that you wouldn't have been able to um, come up with this list or most of this list on your own. But again, the knowledge is one thing, knowing that you should do something and then actually doing it is completely different. If you are in the habit of making impulsive decisions and going with your gut, as most of us are, um, just because that's, you know, that is the way that our brains and our bodies have been, um, have evolved to uh, be and respond. Um, that's, you know, you're human, I'm human, we're all human, <laughs> that's what we do. But the awareness that, that by not following the steps, by not asking those questions, by not engaging in these um, techniques to prevent problems, to prevent dis disastrous decisions, once we're aware, um, then now it becomes incumbent upon us to practice these things. And again, over the next couple weeks, uh, over the next um, few weeks of the course, this is, these are the things that we'll be talking about and these are the things that we'll be practicing is how we can apply these techniques and apply these strategies to um, the challenges that we face in our day-to-day -day lives um, to begin making more effective decisions and begin um, you know, doing things that are going to help us prevent pain now and in the future. So for these, the 12 techniques, um, the one that I feel that I commonly use and um, have you know, relied on most is making predictions about the future. However, the problem that I've had with this is that most of my predictions about the future are hyper-focused on the positive outcomes. And so where I, you know, where I think on some level that is a good thing, so I'm kind of predicting the positive outcomes, um, it does become a challenge because I, if I'm not, I haven't, if I haven't considered the negative worst case scenario and planned for that eventuality, um, then, you know, many times I have come into contact with punishment uh, because the decisions that I've made while, you know, while made with rose-colored glasses um, didn't turn out how I had anticipated. And that has caused me to have negative thoughts about myself and my decision-making capabilities, um, which, you know, when you, when, 
I have now taken the time to do some self-reflection and think about my patterns of behavior. I understand where that comes from. Um, and now my goal is to actively work to um, think beyond the positive potential outcomes and think about what could, uh, what could the negative outcome be and then take actions to prevent that negative outcome. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the one, the one thing that I do have the most struggle with and have, has been pretty consistent throughout my life is um, considering the perspectives of others. So I tend to get stuck in my head. I tend to, um, you know, want to make decisions on my own. Many times, you know, if I've been in a position of leadership, um, you know, it's my, like, my... my uh, reputation's been on the line or it's my, you know, I'm the person in charge. And so, you know, a problem come, you know, it's, I identify a problem. I identify a solution. I roll out that solution. And again, I'm being, I'm in particular, I'm trying to emphasize the I, 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 and all of that, um, which has been, you know, a big struggle for me. Um, historically is being, you know, just being so wrapped up in what I'm doing and so stuck in kind of this, you know, uh, more of a stress mode where it's like, I've just got to, I've just got to act. I've got these problems and I just need to act. And, you know, rather than slowing down and taking a step back and considering the big picture and considering, and, you know, talking to others, communicating openly and, and seeking information and seeking others' opinions, I would just act, kind of act in accordance with how I felt. I would go with my own gut, um, which again is the point of this whole book and is the kind of the foundation of this course is to stop going with your gut. It is common. It, um, you know, there's a reason why we've kind of adapted to respond to the world in that way. Um, but due to the complexity of the systems in which we live um, and work and function, it is critical that we are putting a check on that, right? We're kind of we're checking our gut reaction before we just impulsively respond. Um, because we know that those impulsive responses are many times going to lead us to take actions, which while they might serve the short-term benefit, they might, you know, get rid of that pain. They might even get us some benefit. Um, but the long-term sustainable outcomes are generally not going to be there if you are responding in a, an impulsive or reflexive or automatic way. 